Right, well, thank you all for coming here. Hopefully I have something a little bit useful for some of you, and I'm sure that Harold and Liddell will have something that is also of value, for because not everybody farms exactly like me. I can't do what some other operators do with my equipment, but for what I have, I'm looking at optimizing what resources do I have available. Well, when I started out, I had access to some family land, I had a few pieces of equipment, and just a little, my contact information if you want to send me a message afterward or something, I, I like to talk. And I don't mind email. Uh, so yeah, I've been farming organically since 2014 on the farm. The farm I grew up on has never been a truly conventional, ordinary Midwest farm. Dad was a dairy farmer his entire life and was stopped growing row crops in the early 1980s and just gr had a grazing dairy. So I've got land that has not seen synthetic inputs that whole time. It also has some weed seed bank contributions from that time that are still present. Velvet leaf lasts forever. So where did I start? I had an IH78 mid-mount cultivator, and I bought a $750 John Deere 400 rotary hoe. Used rotary hoes are readily available, but when they say field-ready good spoons, that means you can till, still tell that there was a spoon on it. <laughs> Buy whatever used rotary hoe you can find, replace the four wheels closest to each row. And then I, I rotate them every, every year or two. I buy a couple more new wheels and move the other ones a little farther away from the row because in that row space is the most important. And so you find what you've got and learn to use them well. These two tools grew me a good crop for several years, but I could see their weakness when I had, had funds or found something, added something else. And the last thing, Plan your primary tillage around what cultivation equipment you have. If you have a cultivator that cannot get through high amounts of residue, you need to do something with your primary tillage so that you don't plug your cultivator. Here, 2015, we were kind of wet, couldn't get in everywhere when I wanted to, but if you see this little strip here, that has not seen a rotary hoe. This has been rotary hoed several times. I still don't like these weeds, but I would have nothing if it wasn't for that rotary hoe. So, there's sometimes you push the limit of, is it dry enough to do the best job with the rotary hoe? No, but if this is the best chance I'm gonna get, sometimes we just gotta send it. <coughs> But here, I, I wanted to be able to leave more residue on the soil surface, so I started looking for what are my next options. But first, now, so finally, that wet spring, it dried out enough to cultivate. But if you see over here, these little weeds here, they've been uprooted. If it rains tonight, they're just transplanted. <laughs> Still better than this, because they got set back a little bit. So as that corn is, it's too big to rotary hoe, at least I normally think so. There was rain in the forecast for the next day. As soon as I finished cultivating that field, I rotary hoed it. Did, ripped out a few corn plants, broke a few off, but much less damage than I expected, and it more thoroughly uprooted those transplants. This is like two days later. We were, I'm, I'm glad that I pushed through and cultivated it when it was marginal conditions in this situation. But we kind of dried out eventually. So this corn a little farther along. This, I'd be afraid to rotary hoe again. But th this was the next time that field was dry enough to get through. And with the mid-mount cultivator, you have really good clearance for tall corn, except when you turn around. 
your, your turn rows get butchered, but everything else, four foot tall corn will duck under that toolbar just fine. So my next step, to handle some more residue. A, a Lilliston cultivator, not the best. They're, they have a place, they're not, there's things that could be better about them, but they can handle residue. But you do have, if you see here, I have some, some rye that never got quite completely terminated pre-plant. Something that big, the Lilliston will not completely remove. You need smaller weeds, but this was $350 auction yard find. So my next step, I wanted to have the precision depth control and adjustment, but I wanted more residue, more residue flow, so I heard Gary McDonald speak, met Jared Cyverling, a great organic farmer in northwest Wisconsin. He's become, become a great friend and a good, we bounce ideas back and forth off of each other. He'd also heard Gary McDonald talk to Gary McDonald, kind of thought, hey, let, we can make these IH cultivators handle more residue. So in the shop with the welder, added about 18 inches to each of these bars so each shank can be farther apart. I think I've got about 14, 14 inches between the closest. With this spacing, if I can get residue through that flat fender shield, it'll go through here just fine. I hate those shields, but there's nothing else that will do what they do. So it's kind of the way it is. So here, first time I ran that, this is the upper limit of surface residue that will flow through sufficiently with that system. It needs to be sized fairly small, but those, those small soybeans was able to cultivate very close, not bury too many. And yeah, if, the, if weed pressure is high, I run about three inches, three and a half inches between those sweep wing tips. You've got to drive straight, or at least close. And soybeans are, the, there's some, tr my soil type, heavy silt loam and silty clay loam. Pitch those sweeps forward so that that wing, oh, I run my three quarter sweeps backwards with the wide wing toward the row. So you, that wing tip needs to be just below the surface when you're that close. You get that too deep and it'll just rip up everything in the row. Soybeans and all, but you just skimming just under, kind of burying those weeds right in the row. It does, and you get a little more residue flow if you have the one sweep inch and a half ahead of the other, alternate on each side of the row. You get better flow between them. And sometimes when there's too much residue, well, I need to be tight. Those shields plug. Take one off. I'm just dra dragging, the, dragging that fender just over the row so that as that soil rolls in, it can't completely bury the plant. That shield gives that leaf a little spot to stick out. You'll see in my next, oh, this was, I had some volunteer sunflowers. Volunteer sunflowers this thick are not fun. But it doesn't look too bad here. This four acre field still had about 40 man hours pulling volunteer sunflowers out of it. But we, all, we never had to pull one more than an inch away from the row. Could have been worse. And th that field yielded around 70 bushel to the acre. So I could, I could pay for the, for the walking, but I don't want them. Here, this is more, more typical condition. You see here, this row looks bad. This is why I take a lot of pictures every year. It, every time I look at this, I think I should fire the cultivator driver. He is killing too much crop. But this little bean plant here, it's got one leaf out. As long as we got one, got, got one of those buds where it can see the sunlight, a week later, we're fine. And I plant them thick, and only the strong survive. This is that same field a few days before harvest. They fill in well, and there's, there's not much that isn't soybeans there. But typically, I do this, this has been hand rogued. There's probably two and a half to three man hours per acre in that field after, 
after my best cultivation job. And on my farm, it's 99 to 1 velvet leaf. Velvet leaf is the weed that escapes the cultivator. Giant ragweed, if it's in the seed bank, it'll escape in the row. I have zero tolerance on giant ragweed at home. It's easier to keep them all pulled than to try to sell. I'll stop the combine to pull a giant ragweed if it got missed. I don't want to spread those seeds around. Next thing, I'm, again, I wanted to handle residue. I picked up a Buffalo 4600. My friend Jared loves these things. He convinced me to keep trying a few other things. They work. They can handle residue. I've done some soybeans into crimp rye. Take the cutaway discs off, so just running the, the coulter and a 20-inch sweep, you can clean up some of the weeds out of your crimp rye. You can't get in the row, but you can clean it up some. You can also flip those cutaway discs so they're throwing at the row. You can really hill your corn up high, bury some in, in row weeds. So it's a nice tool to have in the toolbox. But I farmed four years without one. Here, same field, first cultivation. This was with the soybean prices this summer. I got a little greedy and I planted some double crop soybeans after winter wheat. That amount of residue is about the upper limit of what will flow through this cultivator. The newer buffalo cultivators that have the cutting coulter and a rubber depth gauge wheel I think can handle a little, little bit more, but this is kind of the limit. I can plug a buffalo, but it's, it's pretty hard. And here, a trick that I learned, so here I can't as finely control the flow of soil right into the row to bury the in-row weeds. But plan B, this, this is after cultivating, there's a little bit of a ridge on each side of the row. I ran a rotary hoe after cultivation. That kind of breaks up some of those clods, dislodges weeds better, and that fine soil kind of settles down in the row to bury those small weeds. So instead of having a little weed, you can't see them, you can't see them, but Look between a crack between some clods and you see that little seedling there. If you can break up that clod and put some little fine soil on top of that little seedling, it's done for. The next step, as I mentioned, you've got to drive precise when you're running close to the row. GPS is great. I farm a little over 200 acres with most of my equipment is older than I am. A good GPS unit would cost more than most of my tractors. So, good tool, I'm not there yet. Set of shanks on the, cult, on the planter, planter frame, centered between rows. I have two on each side of the planter. And then I started out with a rubber single rib tire on the planter frame to follow that groove. And same single rib tire on the front, front tractor tire front of the tractor, that will follow those grooves. Had, had to make a few, I can't use a time weeder in this system. I'll fill my groove in. But with a rotary hoe, I've taken a couple wheels off the rotary hoe, and now I have a rear mount, rear mount cultivator that's more or less that mid-mount cultivator <coughs> that I can't get quite as close on the row, but for corn and sunflowers and soybeans that aren't too high a weed pressure, five to six inches between the sweeps is fine. And I've been putting together used parts and fabrication. It cost me about $1,000 to accumulate the used parts to make that guidance work. So here on my rotary hoe, I took off three wheels over each of those guide grooves so I don't fill them back in. Tine weeder, if we run that tine weeder, we fill in the groove. Sometimes there's a time where I'll just, the tine weeder is the better tool. I'm committing now to make my first cultivation where I actually have to steer the tractor. It's much more tiring days, but sometimes it's what I gotta do. So here, with those guide grooves and the buffalo cultivator, get the tractor in the grooves and drive. Run, run the cutaway discs as close as they'll go on a 4600. Works just fine. Here, and then here we've got the, the rear mount IH running through some sunflowers there. 
every now and then the tractor will jump out of the grooves, but so you, you have to pay attention to whether the tractor is staying where it's supposed to be, but I can actually watch the cultivator while I'm cultivating, which is really nice. And I find out that you know I'm not clenching my teeth all day. So there, I'm run, running in some soybean with the guidance here. I still haven't found a good way to remake my groove to guide me on the second pass. So here I've actually got to steer by hand again, but crop this tall. And oh yeah, I bought, I bought another Lilliston so I don't have to adjust. I've got one set to throw at the row, one set to pull away. That can make a big difference in season having multiple cultivators, so it's just hook up and go, maybe make a f few fi fine tweaks instead of readjust everything, because now maybe I planted two fields of soybean and a field of corn in between. I don't want to be switching back and forth and back and forth when each crop needs it. And with cheap older equipment, easy to justify by buying another $400 cultivator. Though, they're getting harder and harder to find out of fence rows because either Organic farmers are buying them, or they already went to the scrapyard. What's next? The, the newest addition is fire. I, didn't, I kept telling myself I don't need a flamer, I can cultivate well enough. Well, that's true most of the time. I grew some sunflowers, which, by the way, they're a great crop to grow. I love them, except there is some more risk. If you get an 80 mile an hour wind August thunderstorm, and your sunflowers are about three weeks away from harvest, they are 80% on the ground. Now I got lucky and we were then dry and so they didn't, after that, and they didn't mold. And I picked up about 80% of them. But 500 pounds to the acre of sunflower harvest loss will come back to bite you the next year in a row crop. Hmm. So I found a Flamer, this was built from using some Luteki burners on a kit. The farmer who built this kit mounted those burners way too close to the rubber gauge tires. If there was the least bit of tailwind, I had the glowing orange halos following me. I was, I was not thrilled with that. So back to the shop for some modifications. I mounted those on the back of those cultivator parallel arm sets, not at the, on the front position. And so you can see here, this is scary. I've got a good stand of corn. It looks toasted. But this is where you need to have confidence or friends. Found a few guys who had experience with flamers, you know, text them my pictures, hey, how did I do? And they say, uh, you did all right. Come back, in a come back in a couple days. And yeah, I, I didn't kill all the sunflowers. They're, they're tough to kill. You can actually use a flamer to control weeds and sunflowers at the right stage. So. Just for reference, this little guy, you need true leaves out. This guy probably has enough of the growing point tucked in tight, it'll probably survive. But the ones with, once the true leaves get about as big as these cotyledons, they die fairly well. So this is the end of the season. This, I didn't get a perfect kill on the sunflowers, but that's good corn. Here is what would have happened if I didn't flame it. That was bad, and here's fairly representative area of the field at harvest. It was, corn yielded a couple percent above average, so I think the flamer did its job. And that's all I've got.